right, so in the interest of time, um, let's do get started. Um, and we'll open up with um, the purpose of this workshop is to examine small schools that have a really big impact. And so my name is Jennifer Mirandi Benson. I'm the social studies department chair at Aspen High School. And um, I'm just wondering kind of where are you from? Where is the audience from? So if you would just uh, wouldn't mind unmuting and I'd invite you to turn your cameras on just for that sense of community in this remote world. If we want to start with maybe Philip. Okay, well, um, Serena, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, I live in Vail and I go to Vail Mountain School. Okay. All right, so we go to we go to Vail next. Let's see, Mike. Hi, I'm from Basalt, Colorado. From Basalt, all right. Thank you, Sarah. I'm also from Basalt, Colorado. Awesome. And Maria. Um, I'm a parent from Durango, uh, Colorado. My child will not get out of bed, so I'm trying. I'm working on that. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. And Annalise. <clears throat> I'm from Meeker. I go to the Meeker High School. Meeker. All right. So the reason I love doing this is we very truly much represent the Western Slope. I mean, we are from Vail, from Basalt, two of us, from Durango, from Meeker. I mean, we are representative of the Western Slope. Um, so thank you so very much for being here. Um, I'd love to um, have our panel introduce themselves um, from St. John's, Drake, Denison, and then hopefully we're going to have the Reed representative jump in with us in a little bit. So let's start with Natalie at St. John's. Good morning. Uh, my name is Natalie Blaze, and I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at St. John's College, and we are located, we have two campuses, so I am physically located in Santa Fe and New Mexico, and but I also represent our campus in Annapolis, Maryland, and I grew up in Denver, so happy to be with you guys today. And Carmen with Drake? Sorry, technical difficulties already. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Carmen Avila and I'm the a senior admission counselor for Drake University. Um, I'm regional, so I live here in the Denver area and our school is located up in Des Moines, Iowa. And Sarah with Denison. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you in Colorado. Good afternoon um, from here in Ohio, where I'm currently located. Uh, my name is Sarah Burns. I am a senior assistant director of admission here at Denison. Um, we're about a half an hour east of Columbus, Ohio. I'm also an alum. I graduated in 2012, so I'm excited to be chatting with you today. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. So let's kind of dive into our questions. Um, the first question is, you all represent liberal arts colleges or universities defined by collaborative and lifelong opportunities with passionate teaching and student engagement. What does this look like for your institution? And we'll start with Natalie and St. John's. Yeah, um, so what does it look like at St. John's? Um, so a couple things. We, we, our curriculum is is set. So we're one of the, I think one of two colleges, Sarah Lawrence and St. John's, and I think there's a third. We actually don't have any majors and departments. So we are a community of 800 students um, on two campuses, and there are only two class sizes. There is tutorials that are about 14 to 16 students, and then there's seminar. So, you know, you're right there. And all of our, should, I should say, I guess the most important part, it looks like because all of the classrooms when you walk in are round table, or they're sort of oblong, but they're, you know, everyone's sitting around the table. There are no lecture halls. So the faculty and student engagement starts uh, from freshman, from your first day of freshman year. And then it goes into the coffee shop. And let's go to Carmen. Yeah, um, so at Drake, we have kind of what we call the Drake Commitment, um, and it has four pillars, and that's personal mentorship, power of community, um, lifetime of value, and opportunity to serve. So really just 
highlighting with every student that comes onto our campus that we're really um, ensuring that we're going to mentor and guide our students. Um, so really asking those questions as a freshman, your very first year of what do you intend to do with your degree? What, what do you hope to achieve career wise? Where do you want to end up? Asking those questions very early so that we can help select classes and programs and things that are really going to benefit you specifically. Um, and so the typical Drake student is very involved um, like a, with the pillars of the opportunity to serve, you're really, they're very service oriented, looking for those leadership opportunities. Um, the power of community, I really love, um, that really goes into the mentorship, but also with the, the location that we're in, we have a lot of um, alum who very, stay very connected um, and, and really provide resources and opportunities for our current students. Um, but from day one, you're in your programs, smaller classes as well. Our average class size is about 21. So kind of as Natalie was saying, we do have some lecture halls, uh, but like for education and business and the, once you get into those much smaller programs, the classes are kind of pod based like that. We're, we, we're not big fans of sitting in the classroom and, and just being lectured and taking notes. Like we really like that class discussion, the critical thinking, the engagement. Um, and you'll find that within a lot of programs at Drake University, which kind of is that liberal arts thing, is that personal connection and that individualized attention that students get. Awesome. And then we'll hear from Denison and then we'll welcome our Reed College representative. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, so Denison approaches this, I think, in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, as far as um, kind of collaboration, we really do believe in mentorship as a uh, I guess I'll steal the word pillar of what we do. Um, so 92% of Denison students report finding a mentor before they leave. Um, nationally, that number is only about 22%. So we definitely try to focus on that mentoring aspect and really giving students that person that they can connect with across their four-year Denison experience. Um, on the other hand, we have the resources of a much larger school. Our endowment reached a billion dollars this year. So for a school of our size, that's massive. Um, and so we really are able to offer the opportunities of a much larger institution with research for everyone, um, paid internships for everyone, um, you know, study abroad for everyone. If those are the things that you're really interested in, you're going to have those opportunities at your fingertips. Um, we want to make sure that no one has to go without for those, those types of opportunities that can really help, whether it's grad school or career, you know, whatever's in your future. But you get the benefits of that small liberal arts college where you can double major very easily and do all of the clubs and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like everything you want to do, you can put it all on your plate. Um, and, and we really want to make sure that's available to everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, our Reed College representative here is here. If you would please introduce yourself and I'll repeat the question for you. Great, thank you so much, everyone. My apology, a little snafu without uh, what time it was supposed to be. <laughs> My name is William, the Associate Dean of Admission at Reed College. I worked here for about seven years, and I'm looking forward to the question. All right, Hui, thank you so much. Um, you, rep you represent a liberal arts college um, defined by collaborative and lifelong opportunities with passionate teaching and student engagement. What does this look like for you at your institution? That's a great, that's a great question. And I think it looks like in several ways. Uh, one is it's based on a grading philosophy. Uh, for itself, we don't uh, offer back traditional grades. We do have great like a 4.0 GPO scales, you know, all that fun stuff. But when your professors, you know, give back your assignments, whatnot, they will write a paper about your papers with incredible details on how you write, how you think, how you process information. Um, so that really helps students, you know, think about their work critically, but also not compete against each other as well. Everyone must do a senior thesis, you know, to graduate. And when you do that, you actually have an office assigned to you with two other seniors in your uh, year so that you would do research together. You know, you might have totally different projects or different ideas. And finally, we give students a lot of research grant to pursue both independent project or also project that they find with other uh, laboratories, research opportunities, things like that. So it's more than just, you know, stating, staying in one location and think that you know all the information. You really have to go out and find, do a lot of research, um, both abroad and also in person. Um, I think, and fi the final component is our professors. Since we don't have grad students, you really have to, they have, we have to use undergraduate student as their research assistant for all different departments. So during the summers, we have about one third of our students stay on campus to work with professors on different projects and different ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, second question, as selective as you are, what can applicants do to differentiate themselves? What really jumps out at you on an application? And we'll start with um, Carmen and Drake. Um, so really what stands out to me um, when I'm reviewing applications for my students is just um, what, what, what did you choose to fill your time with outside of being a student? Um, at, at college, you're going to be very busy, <laughs> hopefully, right? You're going to be involved in organizations, focusing on your academics, um, finding work-study opportunities. So there's a lot going on. And um, you're new to being independent and not having teachers and parents, you know, really making sure that you're staying on track with your things. Um, so seeing that students chose to be involved as a high school student is a really strong indicator that like they're going to be successful in college. They're going to be able to handle the many things that will get added to your plate as a college student and, and still be able to be successful. Um, and so that's really what I'm, I, I know for, for me specifically, that's something, um, I don't want to take all of it. I want to make sure everyone has good opportunities, but that's something that I definitely uh, look for just because it's a lot to handle and showing that you can be involved at 16, 17, 18, that's a good indicator that like, I, I, you're going to be able to handle the, the changes with, with entering into college. Thank you. Sarah with Denison. Yeah, that's a really great point, Carmen. I would definitely echo that. Um, but I think from our perspective as well, uh, we focus a lot on the rigor of the curriculum that you chose. So Denison has been test optional for about 13 or 14 years at this point. So we've kind of adopted this model where we're looking a lot more at um, the classes you chose to take based on your environment. And we know that that's gonna look a lot different, um, you know, ver a homeschool student versus a student at a private high school versus a student at a really large public high school. Um, the opportunities you have and the classes that are available to you are gonna look a lot different. And so we wanna see that you challenged yourself based on what you did have. Um, grades are obviously very important. If you choose to submit test scores, you know, we'll use those. If you don't, that's totally fine. But really focusing on um, kind of those challenges that you set before yourself in the classroom, because, uh, you know, all of us are rigorous institutions. And, um, you know, from Denison's perspective in particular, we want to make sure that you are up for that challenge and that you're really eager and excited to dive into, you know, challenging classes when you get to Denison. Thank you so much, uh, Reed College. Absolutely, and I, so I don't want to repeat the same point, but like you know, kudos to what my colleagues <laughs> already mentioned. I think the additional part is that for us, the essays and the recommendation plays a huge role, especially during um, uh, COVID. You know, with so many school with their curriculum being updated. I know one high school lost all their science teachers last year, you know, so it's going to be real hard for students to take sciences uh, during, you know, that period. So we're reading files in a very contextual basis. We're trying to figure out what is going on at your high school, what changes, what happening. Uh, and we also made a few changes. First off, we are test blind. We no longer require test scores to um, apply to read, and we will be test blind until 2024. So it's going to be a while. Um, so without that, we obviously going to look at your curriculum really closely. We're paying attention to, uh, to attendance if that's provided. Uh, we're paying close attention to if math and science is, uh, is a possible course that you could take and did you take them as well. We saw a huge decrease of students taking those two areas, two courses during the, um, during the pandemic. And so we're paying very close attention to that and see if, continue, if students continue to, to challenge themselves uh, consistently. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Natalie at St. John's. So, you know, I'll reiterate everything that my colleagues have said. Um, I will also add that, so St. John's, you know, our mission is, you know, we're really looking for those students who desire sort of an intellectual kind of deep dive and interdisciplinary sort of approach, right? Um, so for us, the essay, we do ask, we do the common app, but we do ask students to, uh, to submit a supplementary essay. Um, we asked them to submit an essay about a book, but we're really looking to see what kind of impact that book has had on them and how they think and how they reflect upon that. Um, so that's, that's really the focal point of our application, but we'll look at everything in context and sort of holistically, but also in terms of distinguishing, you know, oneself during the admissions process or application process, um, I would say we look at engagement, we really do. And, 
you know, for us, it's important for students who are applying to St. John's to really get a sense of what they're applying to, if they know what they're applying to. So, you know, even if they can't come visit in person, you know, did they, did they, you know, schedule a one-on-one -on -one Zoom? Did they do a virtual open house? Uh, did they, you know, win offer? Did they sort of uh, reach out to current students, you know, we provide lots of opportunities to sort of get to know the campus and the students and the sort of the life here. So I think that that can really distinguish someone as an applicant. And we use that for merit aid as well as admissions. So it's important and, 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 it's, and it can be an opening an email, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be sort of fancy, but we look at lots of different ways that students can kind of engage with us. Thank you so much. Um, we have about 15 minutes before I'd like to open it up to a question and answer session. So this next question, um, panelists, please feel free to just jump in if you have something to add. Um, why, are you at the, why are you at the Western uh, Slope College Fair? What is it about the Western Slope student that appeals to you? I think I, I'll just jump in. Um, this is this is my first time doing the Western Slope, but my colleague before me did it for six or seven, eight, maybe eight years. Um, and we just found a huge affinity, right, for uh, the kinds of amazing students and the, you know, the, I think the environment uh, matches very well with our, particularly with our Santa Fe campus. So we have actually one of our student workers uh, right now she's a senior and she's from the western slope so she's like you gotta go you gotta go even if it's virtual so um yeah it's just part of our long history and we're really excited um we have a great history with those getting amazing students from this area so. and i would jump off that oh i'm so sorry sarah no <laughs> go ahead <laughs> okay, natalie this is my first year to do this there but it's certainly not drake's first time to attend um, and it's consistently, we know that the Western Slope students are very eager and excited um, for this whole college journey. And I know a lot of the times they're open to considering what opportunities they have outside of their home state. They're very excited about potentially relocating to a new location. And that's perfect for out-of-state schools. Um, so really, we, we love the, the, the engagement, the questions that students ask. They're all very well prepared and, and families and students are all very excited, which always makes it more exciting for us to attend, even on a virtual platform. Yeah, that's actually just going to stole the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> um, I think Denison's campus is very geographically diverse, and that's one of the things that is really important to us. Um, we're fully residential, so we really want to draw students from all over. So, you know, obviously I get most of my students in Colorado from Denver because most of the students, they're living in the metropolitan area, right? But there are so many great students in other parts of the state, um, and we really want all students to be represented across the state and across the U.S. as as a whole. Um, and so it's just exciting for us to have students from different parts of Colorado and different parts of the United States to come to Denison and, you know, make up this amazing diverse, you know, patchwork quilt of, of kids from everywhere and really bring perspectives um, and help teach each other in this kind of living learning environment that is our campus. Wow, it's really hard going last. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I'm gonna say that, but that got taken. Oh no, that's not gonna use to. Oh shoot. So I would just say that I think um, for us, we've been recruiting Colorado for years and years, and, and we have like right now about uh, two three percent of our student body are from Colorado. And I think just being from Oregon and being, you know, that's a very strong affinity with students from Colorado, like the value, the cultures, you know, it's both an urban but also a rural state. It's both a very outdoorsy. Uh, which is a little bit wetter than you guys, a little bit more water, a little less snow. So that's the only big difference. So if you like everything about Colorado, minus the snow, you come to, to Oregon. Awesome, thanks so much. Next question, in addition to academic excellence, what is it about your geographic location, your community connections, and your relationships with employers that will allow students to get meaningful employment? And we'll start with Sarah and Denison. Uh, so Denison's location 
it's definitely, I, I'm not going to say it's entirely unique because there's a lot of schools that have a small college town with a big city close by, but we definitely feel like it's a benefit for our students. Um, you know, we're about a half an hour east of Columbus, which is the capital of Ohio, smack dab in the middle of the city. Um, and so our students have some really amazing professional opportunities and social opportunities, but uh, professional opportunities in and around the Columbus area within, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes of our campus. Um, there's several Fortune 500 companies right here in Columbus. Chipotle, Nationwide Insurance, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bath and Body Works, Abercrombie, um, you know, just to name a few. And so their headquarters are here. Our students are able to go to those places and do internships. They, they do do internships there. But then we're also very close to a lot of other big cities, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, uh, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, um, you know, within a day, you can be in Chicago or DC. And so you have these really amazing opportunities for students to get to places to, you know, explore and, and get out. Um, and we really do have a nationwide network as far as internships and things. So um, you have the small college town, it's a very charming, quaint little community um, that really loves what Denison students bring to the table and, and they love Granville, which is our town right back. But then you have Columbus super close and a, a lot of other really major cities close by as well. Thank you so much. Let's go to Reed College. Absolutely. I think I always say that like Portland is located right in, in what I call the Seattle Con Corridor. You have Seattle, you have Portland, you have the Bay Area, you have LA. So you have really dense concentrations of companies that a lot of uh, were helped founded by REIT alumni and things like that. So the top five typical employers of REIT, uh, REIT students after graduation include the Oregon Health and Science University, which is a major research hospital for biotechnologies, the Walt Disney Corporations, um, Apple, Facebook, and Amazons. You know, so a lot of our alumni really help our students you know, find opportunities in those areas. I remember talking to a recruiter from Microsoft when he was on campus. I was asked like, hey, just so you know, we don't have many coders on campus. Like, like as our students, like, like why, why do you come to a school like we to recruit students when you have the University of Washington has the best computer science program in the world right next door. And he said, and this is true for all the broad college, not just for Reed, but that is that, you know, yeah, we can go and find coders. They don't have to go to college. Like that's not the thing that we're looking for though. In technology, it's really about not engineering something to perfection, but creating something that people, ordinary people would use. Like imagine your grandmothers or your mothers, like these products are not meant for just like, you know, high school students who are super tech savvy. So you need people, thoughtful people who think about issues about how technology integrate into, into, the, into the lives of just ordinary people and how does that's done ethically and things like that. And that is really exceptional uh, when it comes to students from liberal colleges. They have that kind of thinking mindset, they have that kind of question, critical thinking that is very different from just how an engineer would approach an issues as well. Uh, we also, of course, have a very robust program in, in terms of like pairing students with different opportunities. We'll pay for, for your internships, uh, flight. And we have a program where, you know, I had a few students who, never bought a suit in their life when they were applying for Goldman Sachs internship. <laughs> we, we literally took them to a, where, <laughs> to a suit warehouse and got them a, their first suit ever to do the interview, right? So we really go up you know, to help students uh, achieve whatever that they want to do. Thank you so much, uh, St. John's. Um, yeah, more of the same, um, you know, although I will say that maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a different stance. Um, our locations, you know, we're in Annapolis, Maryland, and Santa Fe, New Mexico are also both small capitals. And so there's just access um, to legislative opportunities, um, law, government, sort of public service um, opportunities for internships. But I would say that, you know, a lot of our students um, kind of create their own internships. So sometimes they want to go back home and create um, you know, a, a possibility with um, something a little bit closer to home, because we get students from all over the country, all over the world. Um, so, yeah, we just we we put a lot of funding into those internship possibilities and those fellowships, and we really encourage students, kind of starting freshman year, to think about what kind of impact they want to have on the community around them, and you know, what kind of experiences do they want to get. Um, so, we have an amazing career services staff on both campuses that we've really expanded. Um, it used to only be like one person, now they're like several people. And so really they're happy to um, kind of go through that brainstorming process with students kind of one-on-one -on -one and in our alumni network. Um, the job shadowing, the internships, you know, the connections um, we in all the different sectors. So 
you know, we have alumni who are in, you know, entrepreneurs who have done coding, who have done, you know, business startups, who are educators. Um, so there's a lot to kind of figure out. And um, I will just say that we help students kind of do that from day one. Thank you so much. And we'll finish with Drake. Yeah, so um, Drake's located in Des Moines, Iowa. So like many others, uh, Des Moines is the state capital of Iowa. Um, our campus is truly 10 minutes from downtown. So our campus is kind of off to the side, in a more quiet, secluded neighborhood, but quick access for job opportunities and internships. Um, but the community of Des Moines as a whole really provides so many opportunities for our students. Um, I, many of our programs, most of them don't require internships, um, but 92% of our students graduate with at least one, most of the time, at least two internships. But similar to St. John's, our, our opportunities are not limited to just the Midwest and the Des Moines area. We often have a lot of students, especially my students from Colorado who come back maybe over the summer and we help them find summer internships here in their home state location. And so going back to that, those four pillars that Drake has, that power of community and lifetime of value, our alum, no matter where they are, a lot of the times tend to stay very connected with our university and provide those, those opportunities for connections for current students um, to take advantage of while they're undergraduates. Um, but as a city for the Des Moines, um, very huge political hub, the Iowa caucus happens on Drake's campus. Um, and so even if you're not super interested in politics, I think this really helps prepare you to be a more globalized citizen. We will all be voters. Um, and it's a really great opportunity to get that exposure very early on. Um, and then um, like uh, for Denison, we have a lot of companies that have headquarters or branches in the location. And so there's so many opportunities to get involved um, and engage. And sometimes we even have companies come to like our business classes and come with, with problems and let our classes come up with solutions. So you're getting very real life scenarios placed into your curriculum so that it's not all about theory. You're, you're truly taking part um, in, in, in making solutions and, and coming up with creative ways um, to, to take your education that much further. Thank you so much. We just have one question remaining and about 15 minutes left um, of this um, session number one. Um, the question for you is, most of our Western states have large public universities with lower tuition rates. If students are lucky enough to get into your college or university, how can you help mitigate the cost so students can take advantage of the excellent education you offer? And we'll start with Reed so that he doesn't feel like he has to go last. And then please feel, it, feel free, rest of our panelists, to jump in after Reed. Oh, Rad, I was hoping you'd have time to do some Googling real quick, but I got, <laughs> I want to talk real slow so that my, uh, my colleague can have some time to do whatever research that they need to do. But joking aside, I think Reed is one of the, you know, about 100 liberal colleges in the country that will meet 100% of the student financial need up to the full cost of attendance. So our financial aid policy is extremely generous. One, about five, one out of five students at Reed do not pay tuitions or room board to attend Reed. You know, even families who make six figures receive uh, enormously generous financial aid. I like to joke that when you walk around the Reed campus and you see all the buildings and dorms things like that, you notice that, that the buildings are named after philosopher or flowers, not alumni. Our alumni don't give money to buildings. They're really cheapskate on that, but they will give like freely to financial aid. We have like 50 different scholarship named after alumni. Right. Uh, we don't do merit scholarship, we only do need base. Uh, on average, when a student graduates from Reed after four years, the average student debt is between fourteen and eighteen thousand dollars for four years. That's lower than the average for students who graduate from almost every single state school in the Northwest. Mine will be quick, um, just because I also want to say Denison is one of those schools that meets full needs. So uh, we do meet 100% of demonstrated need of our families. We do offer merit scholarships uh, as well as need-based financial aid if that's something that you are interested in applying for. We require the FAFSA and the CSS profile to do so, but you're still eligible for a merit scholarship if you decide not to apply for need-based aid, but just know that we would meet full demonstrated need um, for your family. Um, I'll just I'll jump in. Um, so St. John's is really committed for those students for whom St. John's is a good fit. They'll work with you. I'll advocate for you through the admissions process and the and the financial aid process. Um, 
90% of our students received financial aid. We do have both need-based and um, merit aid. Um, and just kind of a, another amazing thing that uh, we've been able to sort of share with families is um, for those students with the highest need, we have matching Pell Grants. So if you're eligible for a federal Pell Grant, um, say it's $6,000 a year, um, we have a scholarship fund that will match that fully. And it's it's additive. It doesn't take away from your other institutional grant monies. Uh, so we have at least 20, 24% of students on Pell Grants and, um, and that is for four years. So we really want to, it's college shouldn't, or cost shouldn't be a barrier. And um, I'll wrap up. I wish I could say <laughs> that we uh, offer a lot of need-based, um, we, we match that need-based aid, uh, but we have our merit scholarship that is awarded to 100% students that are admitted. So if you're admitted into Drake, you're getting our merit. And that covers, depending on where you hit the scale, about 50% of your tuition. And so that really does bring us into a, down to about in-state tuition rates for our students. Um, and in addition to that, we have a lot of um, first year scholarships for departments. So like for business, for education, our health sciences, um, a lot of departments have additional scholarship opportunities, but I always highly encourage my students to please do the FAFSA because the perks of being an out-of-state private school is that like, I know I'm competing probably with your home state schools and probably others. Um, and so having that FAFSA does help for getting additional grant money and aid money for you, as long as you stay kind of like as Natalie said, just stay active with me and engage. And if you're really interested in, and need seems to be like that final barrier, we can certainly work with that. Um, but yeah, I, I wish we could say that, I could say that we met all, all need base aid. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our uh, representatives today. Truly um, inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions from all of you. They might be to an individual um, representative or to the group as a whole. So please feel free to unmute. If you'd prefer to use the chat, please do that as well. I'm curious about diversity at your school. What percent of your students um, come from a diverse background? I'll, I'll kick us off if you guys don't mind. Uh, so for us, we define diversity in uh, three different ways. First is obviously ethnic diversities, uh, intellectual diversities, and finally geographic diversities. But for us, ethnic diversities, we have about 35% of students with students of colors, 10% of students from uh, international backgrounds. And we do strive to get students from all 50 states. We do have all 50 states right now, 49 different country. That kids from Wyoming finally show up. So we're so excited. So <laughs> finally get the Wyoming kids. Um, for us, the next is intellectual diversity. And that's really is the tricky part. Like, how do you get intellectual diversities? We don't want to be in echo chambers where students all think alike, speak alike, you know, feel like. And so we recruit students from rural areas. We make commitment to students from, you know, uh, from backgrounds that might not think college is a possibility, right? Uh, and uh, finally, we really make sure that those students think that we is an option. We do a lot of outreach uh, for them, um, especially uh, transfer student vet uh, as well. I remember talking to an alumni who graduated from Reed uh, four years ago. His uh, whole family tradition and background was from the military. As, uh, he, he thought his his parents thought he would go to uh, Annapolis, uh, the Naval Academy, but he chose Reed because he said that he wants to meet people who, who disagree with him respectfully, who will challenge him intellectually. Um, I'll go with something really quick. Um, so we are certainly a predominantly white institution. Um, about 26% of our students um, come from a different uh, ethnicity background, um, but kind of as uh, Huli said, we have a very a geographically diverse um, university. We have nearly 70% of our students are from out of state. Um, so very few students, not very few, but a smaller portion of our students are from the state of Iowa. And so we really like to bring students from all kinds of backgrounds uh, because we want our students to be challenged. We don't want you to be in a space where everyone agrees with you and is like you and it's just a happy, you know, go lucky thing. We really want you, like I said, to be more globalized and that, that includes working with 
um, people from all over. And with that, I think we have for the LGBTQ plus community, I think 18% of our students um, have registered that they are part of that um, group as well. And so we really do try to provide as much opportunities as we can. We're certainly not the most diverse school, but over the past about eight years, we have steadily increased that about two to 3% every year. So we are certainly working to bring in much more diverse populations with each coming year. Okay, my turn, I guess. <laughs> um, so about 20% of Denison's campus are international students. Um, actually, this past year, it was 21%. Um, and that's our fastest growing population, quite honestly. Um, about 20% of our students are students of color from the United States. So again, we are a predominantly white institution, but um, you know, definitely large percentage of students from other backgrounds. All 50 states are represented. Only 20% of our students are from Ohio um, and over 50 countries. And then as far as students from different socioeconomic backgrounds, definitely um, a big portion of our campus as well are students, um, again, meaningful need that we are able to, you know, cater to students from all different socioeconomic levels too. Same. <laughs> I'll just tag on to, Den to Denison. Uh, very similar profile. Um, we are teeny tiny. We have, you know, I think I mentioned 800 students total between two different campuses. Um, and we do similar to redefine diversity, diversity in a couple different ways, socioeconomically, geographically, ethnically. Um, we do have about 20-25% of our students are international, another 20% domestic minority students, um, but we really, and we really, I guess, prioritize that sort of diversity in thought, background, experience, um, culturally, just we need, we need people to bring it to the table. Thank you. Um, if I may, um, you know, for our daughter, uh, Serena, looking at during the application process and even the research process, I would say, is where we would be small school, middle, you know, mid-sized school and, and large school. Um, if, if each of you could touch on, in addition to the first question, some of the, some of the reasons that your students decide on a smaller environment, smaller campus or just a smaller student body, uh, the benefits that they get from that um, upon graduation, you know, as a lifelong lesson. I mean, I really like the, the small school, big impact. If we could just kind of uh, I mean, at, at St. John's, I think that the primary reason people choose to come to St. John's um, we are small by design. We are like the tiny house of colleges. We, we've, always, we've always been 400 students plus or minus, and that's why the size is intentional to facilitate those con connections, not just with the students and the faculty, but students with one another, students with the president of the college, still students with the buildings and grounds crew. So you, it's a very connected, sort of robust, but sort of diverse community. Um, and they just want to be around students who are really you know, really want to sort of think about things, right? They really want to sort of um, not take things for granted, not um, just accept things for the status quo. And so that kind of defines the community, I think. Um, and I think that that, you know, that ability to sort of do that in that kind of uh, intentional community, if you will, is, is just, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, um, I, I would say you don't choose to go to a small school unless you want that community. Um, you don't choose to go to a small school, uh, D3 institution, you know, for sports specifically, we may have a, a robust athletic community on campus, but um, you're choosing to go to a place like any of our, our institutions because you want the community, you want rigorous academics, you want to grow and change. And um, I kind of use the idea of college as like an incubator, that metaphor where you're growing from a teenager into an adult and that incubation process, um, you know, you're gonna grow, you're gonna diversify your opinions and your ideas. And you choose one of our institutions because you wanna be around other people who also wanna do that. And each of our schools is gonna bring, um, you know, a unique flavor to what that experience might look like. And so I, I definitely think that um, you know, 
that's what you're looking for when you choose one of our institutions. And you're going to be part of a smaller alumni base, but a really proud alumni base. Um, my sister met a Denison alum on the Great Wall of China. Like, what are the odds of that? Um, you know, but like I, I saw Denison people in the airport flying back from Denver on Friday. And it's just um, you see our alumni everywhere. And this is true of all of our schools, but it's so incredibly heartwarming when you do because you know that you're part of a smaller number and that community is so strong. And I know we're right at time. I just want to add something really quickly. I think also students looking for smaller schools is because they want to make an impact on their school as well. You're looking for those opportunities to personally grow as a leader and develop your own personal skills. And that oftentimes is a lot more manageable or feels less intimidating in a much smaller intimate setting versus a school of like 30,000. It's a lot harder to be able to take on those leadership roles and roles and, and like I said, make an impact. And, and that I think that's at least I probably for all of our schools, a lot of students are looking for, I know that my college is going to impact me and change me, but in my time here, how can I impact and change my university for the better as well? And that's that's very manageable on a smaller campus. And just something that's just a final uh, add to that is just like how much attention and care you get from your professors, right? I remember having uh, met the students who got a internship at the State Department as a foreign service internship, which is very covered, but they pay you nothing. And so she missed the deadline to apply for a research grant to cover that. So she was kind of venting with her political science professors one day and she, the professor literally picked up the phone call and called the Reed College president and said, hey, John Kroger, I need $5,000 right now for one of my students. And he's like, okay, cool, you get the money. And like, so, you know, like professor would do that. Another professor is, you know, she, another student wanted to do this uh, internship at uh, MIT in, uh, in uh, one of the, the cool lab there. And she didn't get end up getting it. He was a finalist, you know. And the professors at Reed told, "Oh, the guy who's the director is. I used to do show with him back in the day in grad school." So again, pick up the phone call. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> you know nothing bad happened. But she's like, "Yeah, I'll give you a call." And they help her find another opportunity at MIT in a, in a, in a different lab, right? So your professors will really, because they have so few students to work with, they really take the care to kind of get to know you, but also invest in your futures and and your progress. I remember my freshman year, I had a class of 300 students in a physics class at my alma mater. I spoke maybe five words to my professors. Uh, so, you know, that's a very different experience between a big school and a small school. Thank you all so much. Um, although our time has officially expired, um, 1045, um, I do want to remind you of two things. The second session begins at 1.15. So you have a, a whole nother list of um, sessions that you can attend. Those begin at 1.15. Are there any other final questions? Um, I would, from the group? Yeah. Can I just invite uh, the colleges to put their contact info in the chat? Great idea. Thank you. So if you have any other personal questions for these um, panelists, please feel free to reach out to them via their email posted in the chat. And um, we hope you have a very good rest of your college fair experience. Um, and we'll be back here at 115.